Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Loretta Young in Irving Stone's great story, Immortal Wife, on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we present a dramatization of a book by a writer who has made a habit of giving us excellent biographies that read like excellent fiction. He is Irving Stone, and the book of his we have chosen is Immortal Wife, which is the story of a woman who married one of the great pioneers of American history, John C. Fremont. Fremont was a soldier explorer whose name every American and especially every Californian should revere. And like many men of action, he owed a great deal to his wife. Indeed, in an age when custom did not often permit a complete partnership between husband and wife in all phases of their lives, Jesse and John Fremont proved themselves pioneers in this sense also. Jesse was truly an immortal wife, as Mr. Stone calls her, and his book is a fascinating and fitting tribute to a wonderful woman. Starring in our part tonight, we are privileged to present Miss Loretta Young. And now, Frank Goss, have you a word or two about Hallmark? There are Hallmark cards for every memorable occasion on your calendar. For birthdays, anniversaries, holidays. Yes, for every occasion that calls for remembrance, for a friendly greeting, a word of good cheer, an expression of sympathy. There is a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And that identifying Hallmark on the back... That says you cared enough to send the very best. Now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Immortal Wife by Irving Stone and starring Loretta Young. Some of us are born men. Others are born women. But none of us comes into the world complete. We are half-beings, searching for the love that can make us whole. I was born a woman, but I lived the life of a man. The life of my husband, John Charles Fremont. I met him when I was 16, in the year 1839. And I loved him for as long as he lived. to talk to you. Yes. That young lieutenant. Who is he? Lieutenant Fremont. John Charles Fremont. Oh, the girls are just buzzing. <laughs> Where did he go? Oh. to bring me some punch. I'm exhausted from dancing. Isn't it a wonderful party? Oh, yes, yes, it is. Wonderful. Jesse, will you come in here for a moment, please? Oh, certainly, Father. Excuse me, Harriet. Uh, will you wait here for Lieutenant Fremont? Tell him that I'll be back shortly. Lieutenant Fremont? Yes. Oh, of course, Jesse. Father. Sit down, Jesse. Oh, Father, you're looking at me rather strangely. Have I displeased you? People have been commenting about your actions of the past two weeks, Jesse. You and this young Lieutenant Fremont. If you mean I've been enjoying his company, I have. You've done as much yourself. You seem quite taken with him. Nevertheless, I would prefer that your association with him be terminated before it goes too far. I'm sure it's perfectly innocent, but why tempt the young man with a marriage that could be so advantageous to him? Advantageous to him? Why, well, Lieutenant Fremont is not an adventurer. He's one of the most promising and talented young men in Washington. But not so promising that he can't see the benefits of a marriage to Senator Benton's daughter. Oh. So you think you've produced a daughter so 
unattractive that I can't be loved for my own sake. No, you're just a young girl, Jessie. It's my job to protect you. Oh, please, Father, don't deal with me on the basis of age. When I was born, you wanted a son. Well, I served you like a son. You've discussed Senate problems with me since I was 14. And now, now suddenly you, well, you thrust a calendar in my face and tell me I'm a child. Jesse, I'm sorry, but I must forbid you to see Lieutenant Fremont again. Oh, I'm sorry too, Father. I love you. But for the first time in my life, I will not obey you. Jesse, I'll have him packed off on an expedition. Do that, Father, do that. Because then he'll prove to you how right I am. Send him away. But remember this, when he comes back, I'll be waiting for him. America was growing, spreading out, weaving a fabric of its destiny. Civilization was moving west, and with the passing years, John was mapping the trails that the pioneers were to follow. And then, at last, Father consented, and we were married. Later, John left Washington again to prepare for a map-making expedition into Oregon. It was his first command, his first big opportunity. But then one day, my father brought a visitor to the house. Hello, Jesse. I believe you know Colonel Kearney. Why, of course. What a pleasant surprise, Colonel. I hope you'll still think so after I've left, Mrs. Fremont. Well, is there something wrong? There most definitely is. Your husband has made a mistake that not only puts his career in jeopardy, but one that also has caused me considerable embarrassment. Well, now I'm certain that anything John may have done will be quite logical when he has had an opportunity to state his reasons. He borrowed a cannon from my command. I acceded to a simple request. I had no idea he intended to take the weapon into the Oregon Territory. What's so terrible about that, Colonel? The War Department doesn't think a 12-pound cannon is necessary to a peaceful scientific survey, Jesse. Well, his only purpose for taking the weapon, I'm certain, is for use in case of attack. Can you guarantee that? We are on the verge of war with Mexico or England or both. How can we qualify the transporting of such a weapon into the disputed territory? I tell you, Mrs. Fremont... This could precipitate a war. I'm afraid Colonel Kearney is right, Jesse. John should have considered that. I have faith in my husband's judgment, and I will not be questioned in his actions. But he's a headstrong young man. I'm glad the War Department has recalled him. Recalled him? A letter was sent to him yesterday. It will reach him before he leaves the assembly area at Call's Landing. Oh, but that expedition cannot be abandoned. It's important. Another officer will be sent to replace John. I'm sorry, Mrs. Fremont. This has not been pleasant for me either. I want to state my position clearly. Good day, Senator. Goodbye, Colonel. Mrs. Fremont. Goodbye, Colonel. Father, how serious is this to John's career? Well, he's already been relieved of his command. As for what else they may do, I, I don't know. Oh. Kearney is quite bitter. John has made a powerful enemy. I want to be prepared for anything that might happen. Father, what is the worst? Well, Jesse, it could be a court martial. Oh. Well, suppose he got a chance to go through with the expedition. If it were very successful, would that change anything? The War Department doesn't give chances, Jesse. No, Father. But a wife does. You sent for me, Madame Fremont? Yes, de Rossier. My husband is being removed from his command. But they must be mad. He's the best topographer in the Corps. I know I have served with all of them. He has not yet received official notification. The letter is on the mail boat to cause landing. Then it will reach him in four days. De Rossier, can you beat the mail boat to cause landing? Oh, please, Madame Fremont. I could not bring the lieutenant such unwelcome news. Can you beat the mail boat? With fresh horses along the way, yes. Oh, then here's the money for the horses. My husband must be gone from cause landing before the boat reaches there. Now give him this message for me. Only this and nothing more. Tell him I said not to delay another day. He must trust me and start at once. Madame Fremont, you are magnificent. 
I go at once. Thank you. Uh, well, one more thing, De Rossier. Yes, madame? Tell him that... Tell my husband that I love him. My father and the whole world came to know the man I had married. He took a cannon across the country to prove that the trail he had mapped was passable for wagon trains. And with his leadership, California decided to join its territory with the United States. John became a colonel, but his success had made him enemies. Strong enemies in high places. Why are you so preoccupied, Jesse? You haven't even touched your food. I have been watching you, Father. You and all your visitors. I know that something is wrong. What is it? Uh, Jesse, I've never been very good at hiding things from you. There's been trouble ever since John practically started the California Rebellion and we took over the territory. He acted unofficially. You mean he acted courageously? That land must be part of this country from ocean to ocean. Americans developed it. Why should others be allowed to step in and take it over? You've argued that point, and so has the president and the war department. Oh, please, Jesse, I know all this, but Kearney is a general now, and he still hasn't forgotten that rebuke from the war department about the cannon. He blames John for this new situation. What do you think he'll do? He's already done it, I'm afraid. John has been removed from his command. Oh, but he can't do that. It's unfair, Father. When without John, California would have been at the mercy of any opportunist nation that wanted to seize it. Jesse, this is no time for temper. John is being returned to Washington to face a court-martial. A court-martial? For what? Patriotism? Or for the petty revenge of small men? I... Oh, Father. Father, what can they charge him with? Kearney has charged him with mutiny. Mutiny. Kearney dare say that? Jesse, you must be calm. All right, all right, Father, I'll be calm. But Kearney is in for a fight he never found on a battlefield. Because John will fight this action until Kearney is exposed for what he really is. These are critical times, Jesse. I, I don't think it will depend on whether John is right or wrong. The, the charges of such a high-ranking officer are almost certain to be upheld. Very well, then. Let them be upheld. We've been defeated before, John and I. But defeat only hurts when you refuse to fight. And I tell you, Father, we are going to fight. In a moment, James Hilton will return to present the second act of Immortal Wife, starring Loretta Young. But first, his name was Joseph, and he lived not so long ago. His last name, not many people really know. Yet I need only say, Lord Jim, and you recognize Joseph Conrad, foreign master of our native tongue. This is the Joseph who said, give me the right word and I will move the world. Yes, the right word can move the world, can double our joys, cement our friendships, solidify our love. And no one appreciates the importance of the right word so well as the makers of Hallmark greeting cards. With the rare discernment of distilled experience, they know what magic words can work. So you'll always find a Hallmark card that truly expresses your own feelings. Joyful congratulations to proud new parents. Felicitations on a friend's good fortune an anniversary prayer for your beloved. There's a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And what is true of the right words in a Hallmark card is equally true of its design and color and quality, too. And the Hallmark on the back tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. Now we present the second act of Immortal Wife by Irving Stone and starring Loretta Young.
fought the court martial and lost. But California joined the Union thanks to John, and he planned to take us there and make our home there. He had blazed one trail, and now he went overland in search of another. And I sailed from New York to meet him in San Francisco. Panama was infested with fever, but I crossed the isthmus to the west and waited for a ship to the new territory. Waited for months until... Gold, man, gold! California's loaded yeah. with it! Why, uh, Lieutenant Veal. I saw you in the crowd oh. when you landed. I thought I'd never get to you. Oh, I'm so glad to see you and the ships. John took an overland route to California. I'm on my way to meet him in San Francisco. Mrs. Fremont, San Francisco has gone wild. It's the gold strike. People are pouring into the place. The hotels are dirty, they're cold, they're jammed, and there's no help to be had. It's no place for a lady. Oh, I'm not like other Washington ladies, Lieutenant. You have something else in your mind. That, that new passage that your husband was looking for, Mrs. Fremont. Yes? He went into the most difficult part of the Rockies just before the worst storm anybody in the region can remember. It's been a bitter winter. What are you trying to tell me? Your husband was injured in Snowbound. He sent out a relief party, but it, it took them a long time to break through. They said that none of the others could have lived for more than a few days. Then you think my husband is dead? Yes, Mrs. Fremont. Oh, no, Lieutenant Beale, he isn't dead. Because he knows that country, and no man in the world is better equipped to survive it. No. No, he isn't dead. Well, I hope you're right, Mrs. Fremont. But in any case, he didn't get through the Rockies. Go back east, Mrs. Fremont. If he's all right, he'll be there when you get back. Thank you, Lieutenant. Thank you for your kindness. Y you think my husband is dead, but I have a feeling he isn't. He promised to meet me in San Francisco, and we keep our promises. I'm going to San Francisco because I believe that my husband is there, waiting for me. <laughs> John had made his way to San Francisco, and he was waiting for me. There was gold in the ground, and as though the earth itself were rewarding John, gold was found on our land in the Mariposa. But John couldn't stay. The country was still growing and moving, and there was a need for a railroad from east to west, and only one man could show the path it should take. My husband but I could only follow him with my heart. Jesse, every time you and John are separated, you just seem to waste away. You don't even eat. Why let him go if it affects you so? Because I'm not the kind of wife to keep him from what he feels he must do. I can't... I can't eat because he may be starving. Jesse, this is sheer nonsense. If John was starving, there would be no possible way for him to communicate that information to you. Even if he could, he would refuse to do so. I will not allow you to endanger your health this way. You're deliberately starving... Jesse. Jesse, what's wrong, child? Father? He's all right. I felt it. It just happened just this minute. Oh, no, stop it. See the state you've gotten into. You're, you're so weak. No. No, I'm not. I know, Father, he's all right. Father, what date is it? And what time? It's February 6th, and it's 8 o'clock. Yes. Yes, he's all right now. We'll hear from him. Now that he's all right, we'll... he'll send a message. Good evening, monsieur. De Rosier. Oh, thank heaven. Colonel Fremont is safe, madame. Yes. He sent me with a message. Here, let me have it quick. My beloved wife. 
A very rough journey. Hunger. The men were starving. Days without food. But we were finally picked up by a band of youths. They fed us. Oh, Father, it was the Indians who saved them. I knew he was hungry, but a band of youths found them and fed them. They remember him from the last time he went through on an expedition. Something else happened that same night, Madame Primo. What? The men of the expedition decided to pick their next candidate for president. What a strange occupation for hungry men. Who's the lucky man? The colonel, madame. Your husband. Oh. Thank you, Dorothy. That was very nice of you, man. They were not joking, madame. They will pursue the thought. May I see John's letter, my dear? Of course, Father. But don't read the postscript. That's just for me. Well, I'm interested only in the date. It was written on Fe February 6th. Are you surprised, Father? No, Jesse, I... No, I don't pretend to understand. I, but I'm no longer surprised. The men on John's expedition had not been joking about the presidency. They worked and fought for his nomination when they returned. And he was selected to run against James Buchanan. He had many opponents, strong and influential ones. And among them was the senator from Missouri, my father, Thomas Benton. Jesse, I'll oppose John's election. I'll stump the country, warning the people they must not put a factional candidate into the White House. But why, Father? Why shouldn't John be president? Because he's all too undiplomatic for politics. He doesn't understand compromise, and without compromise, this country will be plunged into civil war. James Buchanan is a master of compromise, and he's the man I'll support. Does Mr. Buchanan's ability to compromise outweigh John's courage, his capacity for work, his integrity? Aren't those the qualities a man in the White House should have? I'm not discounting that. I'm telling you that he's a dangerous candidate. The preservation of the Union is at stake. Buchanan can preserve it. John cannot. Father. Father, I know you well enough to know that you will do what you believe is right. I'm sorry you're not with us. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry too, Jesse. For your sake, I'm proud and happy that John has become one of the important men of our nation. But not important enough to be president. Oh, there are other things more important. The welfare of all the people. I think the voters will realize that, too. I think John will be defeated. John was defeated. President Buchanan preserved the peace of the nation during his office. But the inevitable happened. The cannon sounded at Fort Sumter, and then John, General John Fremont, was gone from me again. And then finally the war ended. And John went back to building his dream, the railroad to the west on our own money. He never finished it. The money gave out, and his health gave out too. So I went to work. Oh, come in, Mrs. Fremont. Oh, it's so nice to see you again. Thank you, Mr. Barney. Won't you sit down? And please excuse the looks of this place. Uh, publishers are rather careless about the condition of their offices. <laughs> uh, what can I do for you? Uh, Mr. Barney, I have been thinking that some of my early experiences with Mr. Fremont... And some of my travels in the early days of the California and the Oregon territories would, would make excellent articles for your readers. I would not question the value of material like that, Mrs. Fremont. Mm. How much will you pay for each story? Why, uh, we can pay $100 apiece, Mrs. Fremont. Uh, providing, of course, that the articles work out well. Oh, they will. They will, Mr. Barney. I will bring you ten of them early next week. Ten in one week. But you needn't drive yourself so, Mrs. Fremont. Uh, we wouldn't need them that soon. Oh, perhaps not, Mr. Bonney. But I will need the money that soon. You see, 
General Fremont is ill with pneumonia. And I have arranged to take him to Nassau to recuperate. I'll need the money for the tickets. Mrs. Fremont, I'm sorry the General is ill. I've always been an admirer of his and of yours. Thank you. I hope he recovers. I dislike the thought that... that you might be left... alone. Alone? Oh, I can never be alone. I have had the greatest happiness I believe a woman can have. I have always loved my husband. And he's loved me. That's the greatest gift that life can hold. When one is weak, the other must be strong. When one is ill, the other must be well. When one despairs, the other must be calm and helpful. Neither can be the strong one, the well one, the brave one, all the time. This, this is marriage. Before James Hilton and Loretta Young return, I wonder, how does your garden of friendship grow? Most of us, I guess, tend to take our friends for granted. But aren't you always pleased at every unexpected message from a far-off friend? Why not give your friends that same fine feeling soon? It's easy, easy as choosing a card from the wide and varied selection for friendship offered by Hallmark. For example, here's a friendly card that says, Just thought I'd drop a line or two to pass the time of day and say, Hello, what's doing? And how are you anyway? There are many other Hallmark cards for friendship to choose from, large or small, short or long, humorous or just plain friendly. Hallmark cards always bring a cheerful glow to each friend who receives one. And you'll know a nice warm feeling around the cockles of your own heart too. So list the friend you don't want to forget. Then visit the friendly store where you'll buy your Hallmark cards. You'll find a card that's exactly right for every friend. And the Hallmark on the back says you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. The resourcefulness and the tenderness of a dynamic woman were never better exemplified than in our story tonight. Miss Young, your performance has made this a memorable evening. All of us in the Playhouse, thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you, Mr. Hilton. It's been a pleasure. And thanks especially to Paul McVeigh, who played Thomas Benton so splendidly. I've admired your series here in the Hallmark Playhouse. Your stories have importance. Certainly tonight's story did. But perhaps that's because anything that has to do with people is important. You know, all of us, I think, really care what happens to others. We may not always have the time to show it, but deep down, most of us want to be thoughtful of others. And I must say, your Hallmark cards give us a very easy way to express those emotions on any occasion. Thank you again, Mr. Hilton, for inviting me here this evening. Invite me again. We certainly shall. And may I suggest that you listen in next Thursday when we shall present Zoe Aiken's great story of the theater, Morning Glory, starring Elizabeth Taylor. And the following week, One Foot in Heaven by Hartzell Spence and starring George Brent. And the week after that, Betty Smith's A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, starring that wonderful little girl, Margaret O'Brien. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our director-producer is Dee Engelbach. Our music is composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. And our script tonight was written for radio by Joel Murcott. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. Loretta Young can currently be seen in the 20th Century Fox Technicolor production, Mother is a Freshman. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.